next speaker is a maintainer of MomentJS, a JS Foundation delegate to TC39, and an engineering manager in Microsoft Azure Site Reliability Engineering, and will be telling us all about patterns for library design. Everybody give it up for Maggie Pine. Hello. How is everyone? Are you like lunch tired? Lunch, OK, you're, you're pumped. You're lunch pumped. That's good. So there was already a little intro, but I'm Maggie. Hi. Uh, who am I? Uh, I do semicolons, and I've converted to spaces because I used to do tabs. But the last time I gave this talk, I got so much guilt that I switched my editor settings, mostly from my dick of a boyfriend who really believes in spaces, don't you, dear? <laughs> Anyways, uh, more seriously, as was already mentioned, uh, I'm an engineering manager in Azure Site Rel Reliability Engineering. Uh, I'm a maintainer of MomentJS. I'm going to pause here and note that uh, MomentJS 3.0, we have been saying this is happening for a year, but yesterday the test built. We're going to have immutable MomentJS. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but <laughs> the library is going to be immutable. Uh, we're going to need docs contribution. That's why I'm putting it out here. We're going to have to redo our entire documentation website. So if anybody is interested, especially if you have a design background, I'm begging you right now to come and volunteer. We are all volunteer. Uh, in addition to that, I represent the JS Foundation, which is a group of open source projects, uh, to TC39, which is, of course, the committee that standardizes JavaScript, which is the language we're all about here today. Uh, in that capacity, I represent you. So if you don't work for a large corporation that has bought into ECMA, if you don't work for Microsoft or you don't work for Google, then ultimately I am your representation. If you would like something championed, if you would like a proposal to move forward, or if you have commentary, uh, I'm the community representative. So I put that out there. Here's my contact info. Let me know what you're interested in. Uh, but we're here today to talk about libraries. So the first thing that uh, I, I want to do is like define a library, because we throw the term around very loosely. But for our purposes here, I'm going to say that a library is a bit of code that's useful when packaged up and distributed to other people. That's, that's pretty simple. Um, this could be internal or external. We like to think of external libraries in the open source space, but uh, believe me, I work at Microsoft. There are many internal libraries that we pass, apart, pass back and forth to each other. I'm sure we are not the only company that does that. So to kind of break it down more, examples of libraries, Lodash, jQuery, Q, Moment, Immutable, Request, these are all bits of code that you bring in and they help you get your job done. But for purposes of this talk, I want to point out that something like Express or Angular, those are frameworks. They go way beyond a library. They enforce programming paradigms. That's not what we're talking about here, nor is something like Webpack. Yes, it's written in JavaScript, but guys, it's a build tool. Um, <laughs> so this talk, it really applies to just libraries, bits of useful code. Now, uh, who, here, who here has children? I have children. OK, lots of people have children. So this is what we think making a library is like. We're like, we're going to share code, and the children are going to happily play at Redmond Town Center, happily giving each other hugs. Um, and their stepbrothers. I'm putting it out there. Uh, this is what having a library is actually like. Does anybody's children have this game? So what's happening is the children are going to hit those buttons, and there's whipped cream on that hand. And like, it looks fun. Grandma gave it to us because she thought it would be fun for the kids. But here's what happens. <laughs> Boom. Kid hit in the face with whipped cream, and yes, he did cry because he lost. <laughs> but here's what that looks like when you have a library. Uh, this is moment.js. Uh, 2,402 closed issues? <laughs> That's a lot of getting hit in the face with whipped cream. Uh, <laughs> And, and to avoid that, we want to make our library good, right? We want to make it good for whatever definition of good there is. So like, what makes a library good? Let's think through that. Um, here's one I hear a lot. Small size. 
Does that make it good? Yeah, no. Uh, or great code? I mean, everyone loves code quality. Does that make it good? Uh, it can certainly make it bad, but it won't make it good. Uh, what about encourages functional programming practices? <laughs> Who's heard about that? Woo. Who's sick of hearing about it? <laughs> All right. Oh, what about amazing, amazing Node.js Webpack, Babel, Mocha, Chai, Phantom, Sauce, Istanbul, Toolchain. We even got the, the like Istanbul in there for the test coverage. Would that make a library good? Guys, none of, none of this will actually make your library good, OK? Ease of use. That. That's the only thing that will make your library good. Without that, you have nothing. It doesn't matter how good your tool chain is or how functional it happens to be. So nobody wants to learn your library. OK, those 2,400 GitHub issues are mostly, I don't understand why your library works this way, and I didn't choose to read your documentation. The Stack Overflow count's pretty amazing, too. <laughs> so it's OK to make it simple. It's OK to not be fancy in a library as long as you have something that people actually understand how to use. So how do we make a library simple and usable and, and like fun? Ideally, it's fun. Uh, four things I'm going to go through. Invocation. How do you call that library? What does that look like? Um, configuration. When we have to change the behavior, how do we set up an API that is conducive to that, that lets us extend into the future? Defaults. How do we set up default behaviors, choose default behaviors, and finally errors? How do we correctly handle errors? Break that down. So I'm going to start with invocation. Um, people like to get really fancy about invocation lately, and I'm going to kind of resist fanciness here and put some libraries on the screen that have been around for a really long time. So static invocation. Here's two really popular libraries that by default have a static invocation. They're a function and you call them. Uh, one is a node request up here. It's, you know, it's a static, like I give it a URL and there's a callback. It's a static invocation. Uh, another one is Lodash. By default, has a static invocation. Uh, this is good. Like people will tell you you should do it different ways, but this is really easy for users to have static invocation of libraries. If you have a simple API, this is the way to go. Um, sometimes this has a drawback. Uh, which is that given enough static invocations, you start getting into this like nested code mess. John David is twitching in the back because he wants me to tell you that Lodash has a functional plugin. <laughs> <laughs> Lodash has a functional plugin so that you can avoid this. Uh, but if you're just dealing with static invocation, you can end up going down this rabbit hole where the code is nesting and nesting and nesting. Um, and when you get there, probably the easiest place to go, you can make a functional plugin, but probably the easiest place to go is to rely instead on factory functions. So a factory function is something that creates a new object that then lets you manipulate that object and do things with it. So three like totally old but good libraries bring in the factory function. Uh, Q, it makes promises. That's what it does. Uh, and then you do what you need to do with those promises. Uh, jQuery. And like, I am going to make the stand for jQuery. We can call it lame. We can, we can rip on it. But like, it's in like every website still. <laughs> there had to be something worth having there. And then finally, moment. If you use moment, um, you invoke the moment function. It gives you back a moment object. And you do the things that you want to do with that moment object. And that's going to give you some really nice stuff. Uh, it's going to give you chaining. Everybody knows you can chain promises. It's very useful. Uh, in the moment example, it's going to let you chain date computations. So this code is very, very readable because we can just kind of work our way to the side. We're adding three days, and then we're going to start of the day and going back a year. I have no idea why we do that, but you know, you can. <laughs> or here we go, go to jQuery. We want to shove some DOM elements in. It's really easy to do. We make a jQuery object, and we append them, and we add some classes. So think about this as a pattern. It's simple. 
to either, you can start at the simplest case with static, or if you have something that's gonna take a little more complexity, is gonna involve a little more continuation of thought as you make computations, then think about using a factory function and returning an object that the user can continue to act on. Generally speaking, it's good to have that object be immutable, so you get a new object every time, but whatever works for you. So the next thing I'll bring up is configuration. Now, configuration, a lot of times when we first start a library, we're like, well, it's lightweight. It's just for this one thing, eh, uh, about the configuration. And, and that's actually what happened with Moment. Like six years ago when Tim Wood wrote Moment, uh, it was like this. The Moment constructor was great. It was like, oh, I have a, a date string, and I can either pass a parse format for the date string or I cannot. Not too difficult. That was the whole constructor. Okay. Um, welcome to the overloads of the moment constructor today. We have, I can pass an array of date parts. I can pass a moment. I can pass a date. I can pass a uh, date string, a format, and a locale, a date string, a format, and strict mode, multiple date strings with formats or strict mode. This is an explosion. And like, unless you're a maintainer and you're used to like reading the constructor, it doesn't, it, it, the meaning is really lost as to what's happening there. It's just a deep mystery. Um, the best way out of this pattern is simply options objects, right? So this is coming out of the ECMA 402 internationalization spec. Is anybody here familiar with ECMA 402? Wow, okay. So what ECMA 402 is, I'm gonna back up and just educate on this one. It is a specification that sits next to ECMA 262 is our JavaScript specification, what defines our programming language. What ECMA 402 is, is a second specification that gives us APIs for internationalization. Things like date formats or string formatting based on a culture and locale code. Uh, and that's something that TC39 works on alongside 262. So the committee is responsible for both. Um, this is bringing some great features to you. So on a total side note to the talk, if you haven't checked out the 402 internationalization APIs, um, they are really gonna help you as far as not having to carry locale data around that you used to have to carry with a library like Globalizer Moment. Um, so check them out. But they've done a really good thing here. What they have here is they have a date time formatter here. This is something that takes in a date and produces a formatted date. And one thing is definitely required in an internationalization spec. And that is the locale, right? Like what language should I print it out in? And because that's definitely required, they've led with that ENAU, that's Australian English, parameter. But then you have all these non-required options. It can make its best judgment for what people who want Australian English expect to see. Or you could say, I want the hour in numeric form, the minute in numeric form, the second in numeric form, time zone name short. But those are all independent and optional. Because they're independent and optional, you're much better off putting them on an options object like they've done here. It completely cleans up that API. It doesn't make you, in your code, write all these funky like type checks. In moment, we're like, if type of bool, then strict mode. Otherwise, it's a string, and then we're parsing a locale. I mean, that code is nasty behind there. Um, so options objects will automatically clean up configuration in any, uh, in any API. And another awesome thing, back to jQuery, telling you, uh, is that they'll allow for some pluggable business logic. So here we have an AJAX request coming out of jQuery, and you can see here that we can automatically define the behaviors when we get certain status codes. So options objects will let you scale that by allowing people to pass in configuration functions easily. So basically, when you're dealing with configuration, there are some exceptions, but put the required parameters first, on any function that you're invoking, and then tag to the end an options object. And almost any API will be cleaned up by this and be cleaned up very quickly. Uh, defaults. Who here has had interesting experiences with defaults? Sure, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty common experience. So let's, let's look at an interesting thing here. This is a plain HTTP request using Node.js. So you're using the built-in library. Um, and I'm making a request here to github.com and then repos Tim R. Wood moment. So moment no longer lives there. 
moment lives now in the moment org on GitHub, uh, but it used to live under Tim's uh, GitHub account. And when you try to go to that URL, what you get back, if you look at the highlighted text, is a 301 move permanently, and there's a redirect URL. If you're using the default node behavior, then what you get is this, a, a redirect re URL, which is nice, except that it would be nice if it would redirect. Uh, <laughs> the general user expectation when you get a redirect URL is like, thanks, can I have that, please, instead? Um, and here's a node request. This is a great example of implementing a plain old sensible default. You make a request to that URL, it redirects, and it re-requests <laughs> to the new <laughs> URL. Uh, and I actually get back, like, information about my repository that I wanted without having to spend a whole bunch of time writing code to handle 301s. Uh, and this is a great example of something I call best by default. This is just what people would want it to do. I understand why Node at the base level doesn't do it, but this is just what everyone would want it to do. So the library does it by default because it's like almost painfully obvious that it's what should happen. And so that's what we try to do with our defaults, right? We try to pick the best thing by default, the painfully obvious thing. Uh, but that can get you. Here's an interesting, interesting little example. There's a lot of ripping on Moment because I know it well and because I can't get in trouble for ripping on my own code. Uh, <laughs> but here's a little example. I have a date time string and like carefully notice that the time on this string is 1025. But when I format it out here, I get 1725. So the time has walked forward nine hours. Did I just do it right? 10, no, 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 seven hours. Sorry, world. And that's because I was in Berlin when I ran that code. And Berlin is UTC plus two. So like, what just happened, library? What just happened? Ken had this problem. Ken was telling me about this problem. <laughs> um, but what's really going on here is that that default moment constructor that just says moment chose this default that is, I convert it to the locale of the local machine. Um, but like, there's lots of options. You could wanna do that, like in the top line there, you could wanna convert to the, the time zone of the local machine, but you might also intend to convert to UTC. Um, you might intend to keep that offset, that minus five offset, which is something like central time. Many time zones have a minus five offset. Or you might wanna convert to a specific time zone. You might wanna put it in the New York time zone. Um, all of those possibilities are like pretty close to equally likely. The likelihood that you want the machine's local time or the likelihood that you want a specific time zone or you want UTC, I, I, I mean, it's kind of a toss up. And what's really going on here is like, there's no best choice. There's no best choice for a default in this API. And in fact, this is like a massive API design mistake on Moment's part, and there's like a blog post that I wrote that gets 100 hits a day of people learning why those constructor functions are different and how to get it to show the date that they mean. And then like we link to that from the docs and then we close issues that link to that and we link to it like several times a week. It's the worst API design mistake in the entire library. And it could have been solved with this. Instead of having a default moment constructor, just moment paren paren, we should have had moment.local. When you parse into this constructor, you get back the local time of the machine. Would have cleared it up a lot for users if right up front, I if someone had made them choose. Do you want local? Do you want UTC? Do you want a time zone? Uh, so with defaults, you have to be careful because even though local is a common case, there's like a million other common cases and now people are confused. So only do defaults when they're the best. When there's no best, make the user choose or suffer the consequences of them being unwilling to read your docs. Seriously. So the last thing I wanna bring up uh, is errors. Errors have been an interesting, like, sticking point, weird point in the JavaScript community, and they have been for a long time. And the reason for that is this beautiful piece of documentation from Node. And it says, 
Any use of the JavaScript throw mechanism, mechanism will raise an exception that must be handled using a try catch or the Node.js process will exit immediately. What does that mean? If you don't properly handle errors in Node, server crash. The process goes. And that is due to some limitations of JavaScript as a language, uh, but it's a scary thing. You don't want servers just going out. Um, for a long time, the community like was like, Node is scary, and they went on like an error suppression rampage in their code, like however I can code to cause no error to ever be thrown is the way to code. Um, and that has its own set of problems because then you don't get any errors. Um, <laughs> So I, I kind of I was actually asking around uh, like people I knew and people from the Node team, and I was like, does Node have any recommendation about how you should handle errors? Like, is there a best practice here? And I, I heard from a couple Node contributors and stuff like that. And like the only thing I got out of the whole thing was that Miles cares a lot about your errors. <laughs> I was like, thanks, Miles. Uh, but we talked this out a little bit, and. Um, we came up with a little bit more concrete idea about how to handle errors in JavaScript. So I'll show you one example here. This is a date being parsed into moment, and uh, it doesn't match the format. Now a date, that's likely uh, user data, like something that someone entered into a website or something like that. So when you have user data, you are gonna wanna do some kind of error suppression. You can see what's happening here is that I'm not throwing a parse exception. Instead, when you attempt to format that date out, you just get invalid date. And that's good because you aren't crashing your node process to just something that a user put in. So, good. Bad input doesn't crash node process. But here's a little different case. Um, moment has this capability of like getting a date part. In this case, it's hours, moment.get hours, and it's giving back 13, that's great. Um, but an interesting thing happens. If I say moment.get hers, uh, <laughs> misspelled hours, I get back a moment object. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> that was really what I wanted. Um, this, is, this is silly. Look, if the developer obviously made a typo, throw an exception. Just do it. Catch those things right away. Here's a really nice example of that being done. This is immutable JS, and immutable you can have a construct called a map, which is you know, a mapping of key value pairs, and every time you change that map, you get a new map back. So you can see this behavior working here, where I create a map, and then I set B to 50, and then uh, you can see on the first map I get two, and on the second map the value of B is 50. So that's great. Um, and then, in immutable, wisely, if I try to create a map out of the number one, which cannot possibly be done, I get like a type error that says, why didn't you give me an array or an iterable object? This is much better. This catches my developer error right up front. So kind of rolling everything up. Make your libraries easy to use. Don't get fancy. Uh, usually that just frustrates your users. Um, the less stuff you put in there for them to think through and worry about the better. But for invocation, either static or in a factory method is gonna work for most use cases. Uh, configuration, remember, require parameters up front and then the options objects at the end. For defaults, very important one. If there is a best answer, if there is undoubtedly a 90, 95% case best answer, then default to that. But if you're below 90%, you'd be much better off making the user choose just from a supportability standpoint. So only do a default when there's a best answer. And then finally, if the developer has obviously done something wrong, throw, let them know, make their life easy. But if it's more a user input thing because of the situation with the node process, you'd be better off trying to prevent errors from, from bubbling up. And at the end of the day, like, share your code. It's good. Um, we, we can all be happy together, and we can all get a lot of value out of shared code. So anyways, thank you all.